Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. If you are enjoying this podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software. Today's program is brought to you in part by the financial support of our listeners. You can support the program on a one-time basis, support.greatdetectives.net, to support us via PayPal. And you can also become one of our ongoing Patreon supporters for as little as $2 per month. Just go over to patreon.greatdetectives.net. Well, now it is time for this week's episode of Sam Spade. The original air date is January 26, 1951, and the title is The Chateau McLeod Caper. The National Broadcasting Company presents The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. <laughs> Detective Agency. Me, sweetheart. How was your vacation, Sam? Who said it was a vacation? Well, I thought you said you were going skiing for a weekend. With me, F, it's always work. Do you know you can get killed on skis? If you say so, Sam. Yes. Most people just break their legs. Most people pick some easy little slope, the cowards. But I know a ski run up near a town called Lucerne that's sudden death. I know a ski run called the Backbreaker. Really? How dull. And one they named Suicide Drop. Effie, stop trying to top me. You just can't. This was the deadliest ski country ever seen. You just sit there while I do a Christiania swing down Market Street, a Galender sprung up the stairs, and a Telmark right through the door with a tail I took out of the deep freeze only last night. The Chateau McLeod caper. <laughs> For NBC, William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, brings you the greatest private detective of them all in The Adventures of Sam Spade. Effie! Oh, oh Sam! Yeah. Take off those skis. I just wanted to prove I could do it. I did a herringbone up the stairs. And those clothes! <sighs> I'll just bet you've rented all those things, Sam. You were never in the snow country at all. So, you don't believe me, huh? Well, here, Doubting Effie, I brought you proof. And don't tell me I rented this. A snowball? Yes. Sam! A real snowball! Yes, I brought back two of them in a thermos box. Where's the other one? I threw it at a policeman. It was a freezy, you know, soaked with water and ice. Oh, Sam, you're wonderful. Mm. I can't believe that you had trouble this weekend. Oh, no? You cut that snowball open and you'll find a blood-stained bullet inside of it. And behind the bullet lies a tail. Ready? I'm always ready, Sam. Yes. Mm-hmm. Date, fill it in to Sierra County Sheriff's Office, Lucerne, California, from Samuel Spade, San Francisco, license number 137596. Subject, the Chateau McLeod caper. Dear Sheriff... You run a neat little county up there at Sierra, and I hate to be snide, but when my train steamed into the cold mountain air of your lovely little village of Lucerne, I knew the chill of death was afoot. It had to be. The place was too beautiful to last. The background hills were right out of the Alps. The snow from Grandma Moses and the rustic buildings that snuggled under the mantle of white were just too cute for words. It was abnormally perfect. Something had to give. Mother. Well... The only young man who got off the train. Are you from McLeod? Well, I'm supposed to find a Chateau McLeod. Oh, what do you know? I got the right man on the first try. Good. Rufus sent me down to pick you up. And you could pick me up almost any time. Well, that took a little chill off the day. Shall we go? Ooh, mush. Mush. <laughs> We glided out of the station, runners squeaking on snow, the soft pad of hooves, and the jangle of merry bells. We had a bearskin lap robe. It was a short bear, so we had to move close. Her cheeks were apple red, and her silk brown hair flowed in a spanking breeze. Oh, it was a scene that will forever be etched in my memory. Rufus, take me 
tells me you're an advertising genius. Well, I have placed a few ads in my day, mostly help wanted. Ah, uh-huh, don't kid me. Okay. He says you're going to put the McLeod canneries right on top with a new campaign. On top. You know, you're supposed to have a big name. Just eight letters, Sam Spade. Oh? Well, I'm Rita Parker. Mm-hmm. I'm supposed to be Rufy's girlfriend. Of course, I think it's only to make his wife mad. Oh. But it's fun up here. Yeah, so this is my first trip. Oh, well, then you're in for a treat. Uh, that is, if abnormal psychology appeals to you. What does that mean? The McLeod guest register is always full of dynamite. Oh. For example, this yeah. weekend reads thusly, mm-hmm. uh, Rufus McLeod with half of the money in the world trying to get the other half. Good. His wife, who has an interlocutory decree. Mrs. Interlocutor, huh? <laughs> Cora. Yes. Her boyfriend, Paul Endicott, a uh, gigolo type. Mm. Uh, Charlie Allison, co-worker and friend to Rufus. He's a, a food technician or something dull. dull. And then there's Tozier Svenborg, ski instructor, who comes down like a wolf on the fold. Paul and Dinmore. people like that. Yes. Well, I'll never remember all the names. I'm in the ad game, you know. It's initials to me. I call people, uh, well, R.L., T.S., uh, N.T.G., and what you know. Well, the names don't mean a thing. Just remember this. Every 30 seconds, duck. I beg your pardon? The McLeod estate was eight miles out of town, and it seemed we were there in no time at all. Rita Parker hustled the Alpine buckboard and mare into a stable while I went up to the chateau to meet my employer, Rufus McLeod. It was more of a Swiss chalet, you know, where the second floor is larger than the first... And I guarantee that no one in Switzerland could have afforded this chalet, even with the second floor the same size as the first. I walked in and found Rufus, big and red-faced, standing in front of a fireplace that could easily have roasted a brace of oxen, rump to rump. Of course, you're Sam Spade. I am, Mr. McLeod. Well, you came at an opportune time. There's no one around to overhear our conversation. I suppose you wonder why I hired a detective for a place like this. Well, not especially. I go where the people go. And the money. Uh, you'll be paid well for your time and trouble. I must be quick. In essence, this is my situation. Yes. Earlier this week, I received an anonymous letter saying that if I invited the guest list I'd planned for this weekend, there might be serious trouble. Uh, here's the letter. Uh, keep it to yourself. It's a Los Angeles postmark. I see. Well, uh, we might start by tracing down this typewriter through an L.A. detective agency. Every one of my charming guests is from Los Angeles. One of them wrote it, if you ask me. Very likely. I want to know who wrote it, if I can, but more than that, I wonder what serious trouble the writer is referring to. The girl you sent to pick me up said you had a very volatile group of people assembled. Yeah, perhaps they're high-strung individuals, but they're civilized. I'm sure their conflict would never get beyond a cutting phrase or two, or perhaps a punch thrown here or there. Well, then you really don't believe you'll have any trouble? Yeah, I don't know, I don't know. I thought it would be advisable to have a man like yourself around. Yes. One who deals in trouble professionally. Perhaps if things do get out of line, you can help repair the damages or even prevent things from occurring. Well, I'll do my best, Mr. McLeod, but it's not easy to look for something when you don't know what you're looking for. Oh, here they come, Spade. Oh. Back from the ski runs. Oh, my I told them you were handling an advertising campaign for my canneries. Well. 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 They came stamping in, pulling off gloves, unzipping parkas, and if it hadn't been for the grown-up dialogue, looking all the world like a group of carefree children. It was hard to believe that the chill of death was also in them even then. I couldn't keep my eyes off one of the particular members of the group, Mossberg ski boots, Chinese vermilion downhill pants, and a candy-striped parka, which she now pulled over her lovely head. The sweater she wore underneath was, I'm sure, designed for someone much smaller. A dachshund? Perhaps? This the advertising man you've been telling me about, Ruth? Oh, uh, Mr. Samuel Spade, my uh, half-wife, Cora. Half? Well, how how do you do? Glad you came, Sam. We can always use another sport in the crowd. Hey, everybody, shut up! Introducing the incomparable, fabulous Mr. Samuel Spade. Yes. Hiya, Sam. I'll give him to your pass, Sam. Me, Paul Endicott, Rita Parker, Charlie Allison, yes, Toja Svenborg. Yes, Charlie's the one who doesn't ski. I'll doesn't. take snowshoes any day. I can't get anywhere on snowshoes. You've heard, perhaps, of the tortoise and the hare. Ruth. 
first ring for some drinks. Tom and Jerry's hot toddies, coffee, grog, something. Yeah, we're having hot buttered rum. The stuff's warming in the kitchen. Well, get it up. Get it up. Right away, Cora. And as for the rest of you, ready? A one, a, a two, one? a three. What? Oh, fill oh. the oh, oh, yeah. dear old oh, man. Shout till the rafters ring. Stand and drink a toast once again. Let every loyal main man say, Oh, do dee do dee do They took up the song with a gusto, lifting imaginary drinks into the air, and it was all very jolly. For a party that was supposed to be fraught with danger, this one certainly started out in just the opposite direction. The drinks came, and things got even merrier. Lunch was served, and afterwards I slipped into some outdoor gear and strapped on some skis. Everybody scattered different directions. Rufus McLeod and I skied to a place three miles away called the Halfway Cabin. Between the chateau and the cabin was a small lake called Royal Lake, completely frozen over. Rufus stood in front of the cabin, firing a 30-30 at a target set up down in the woods to the east. What do you see through the glasses, Spade? Two bullseyes and nothing outside of the eight ring. That's great offhand shooting at this range and standing on skis. Well, I can do much better than that. Watch this. See that silver tip on that big Norwegian fur over there? Yeah. I'll cut it off. Hey, look out! What? What? Well, he came swooping out of nowhere, Spade. I swear he did. Well, I think you hit him. Who is it? It's Paul Endicott. No, no, he's up. Good. There's Cora with him. Well, you Shut told up. me nobody was supposed to be skiing in that area. Yeah, they're not. Well, here he comes, and he looks plenty mad. What do I care about him? He just after Cora for the money I give her, that's all. You might have killed me, you stupid fool. You weren't supposed to be skiing there, Endicott, and it was an accident. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, that was no accident. All right, all right, all right. You, all right. you keep Knock out, off the out of this. You keep out, or I'll throw one at you. Oh, that I'd love. Oh, Paul, now stop it, and the rest of you quit acting like children. Your boyfriend threw a sucker punch at me, Cora, and even if he is my guest, there's a limit to hospitality. I don't call one punch and even trade for a 30 30 bullet. You aren't hit, so don't start crying. Rufus, I have the feeling you wouldn't mind if he were hit. You wouldn't mind at all. Paul, I've just decided I don't like you without a mustache. Well, from then on, everybody dropped the pretense and you knew where you stood. And it was chilly, too. Later in the day, we were all back at the chateau again and Paul Endicott wove his delicate variation on his main theme. I'll knock your block off. I tell you, Mr. Endicott, you have some delusions. I have no delusions, Tozier. I've seen the way you look at Cora, the way you two are always trying to lose me on the trails. Some people ski faster than others. Yeah, well, let me tell you something. The next time you try to wolf this girl, it's going to be your last. I'm nobody's wolf. I'm a ski instructor. That is what I was hired for. Well, stick to what you were hired for. Knock off the extracurricular activities. I don't have to take this kind of talk from you. Anything you'd like to do about it? As a matter of fact, there is. Uh, Fellas. Get it. Boys. Men. Wait a minute. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Uh, Yes. I'll never speak to either one of you again. You, uh... Sam. Sam. Yes, you want me to stop them, Mrs. McLeod? No. I want you to take me out of here. Oh, all right. All right. Well... Let's put on our skis and get out of here. Okay, here, I'll help you. Oh, oh, thank you. You're such a gentleman. Well, even so, I won't take a minute. You ready? Uh, yes, yeah. There we are. Now, uh, where are we heading, Mrs. McLeod? Oh, I thought we might go out to the boathouse. It's on the southern tip of Royal Lake. It's only a mile and a half. Nothing. And my name is Cora. I'm not really Mrs. McLeod anymore. Well, it's kind of rough on you, isn't it, bringing your new boyfriend around all of your ex-husband's friends? I like it up here. Rufus likes to have me. And they're not all against Paul. At least they weren't. But he's on the defensive so much, he's going to make enemies of all of them. Yes, he's off to a rousing start, I'd say. You know something, Sam? Hmm? I don't care about Paul Endicott, really. Hmm? Or Rufus McLeod, or Tosia Svenborg, or anybody. I just care about Cora McLeod. Well, now, that's a good, honest answer. You know, most people wouldn't be that frank. But, Sam... Yeah? I haven't known you long. Well, I, uh... I like your style. Style? I could care about you. It broke my heart not to stop right there on the trail and kiss her because that's what she wanted me to do. So that's why I didn't do it. And I'll never turn down anything better. Well, next scene, a boathouse. And when we got there, it was not at all the way I thought. Food technician and close friend of Rufus McLeod was there... 
working on something that baffled me at first. It's a nice boat, Mr. Spade. That's what it is. Belongs to Rufus. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen one up close before. I'd take you for a ride, but this one needs a lot of work before anybody could use it. I'm just puttering. Mm -hmm. What prompted you to come out here, Cora? Because Paul and Tosha Finbar got in a fight over me, and I got tired of the whole thing. Sam and I went out for some air. Oh. Well, glad you did. I was getting a bit lonesome. You see, Sam, they always leave me in a cloud of snow on their skis, and I just plod along on snowshoes all by myself. Well, maybe we can go walking together sometime. I used to be able to shake a pretty good snowshoe. It's a deal. Tomorrow morning, I'll show you the place. Sam, I think I'll stick around here and help Charlie with the ice boat. Oh. Unless you're crazy about ice boats, why don't you go back to the chateau? We'll be there in time for dinner. Well, I don't need any engraved inver... Exvitation. I hope you catch a common cold. The trouble with that girl was that she only wanted one man at a time around her. Back at the chateau, there was no one but the cook, the Marjorie main part. Ah, uh -uh, too tall. As supper time approached, Rufus came in, then Rita, then Cora, then Allison, and finally Tozier, in that order. And the order is important, because you see, nowhere in the list is the name of Paul Endicott. He didn't come in for supper, nor for the next three hours. It was dark by then, and Rufus McLeod was worried about Endicott. So we fanned out in a searching party. I was alone when I found him. He was lying in the snow, 300 yards west of the halfway cabin. There was a 30-30 slug in him. Period. End of Paul Endicott. You are listening to the weekly adventure of radio's most famous detective, Sam Spade. This Sunday, Cary Grant and Betsy Drake star in the second of the new Mr. and Mrs. Blanding series over most of these NBC stations. The delightful tribulations of Jim Blanding's and his wife Muriel as they built their famous dream house entertain millions as a novel and then as a motion picture. And now you can follow the further adventures of Mr. and Mrs. Blanding's every Sunday on NBC. And Sunday also means your weekly visit with the hilarious Harrises on the Phil Harris Alice Faye Show. And now back to the Chateau McLeod caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. There were no ski marks near the body of Paul Endicott, just his own. Somebody had drawn a bead on him in the dusk from some distance. I started to look for the rest of the searching party and then changed my mind. If the body of Endicott wasn't found, the murderer might wonder what happened to it, get worried, and make a mistake. So I picked him up, carried him to a small cave I found, covered the entrance with snow, brushed over the ski marks, and went back to the chateau. One by one, they all showed up, discouraged. Oh, we, we can't give up. We have to keep looking. I know how you feel, Cora, darling. It's too dark. We'll try tomorrow. Oh, don't worry about him. Paul can take care of himself. How can he take care of himself, Miss Parker, if he got lost? Who said he got lost? I am assuming. I think we're all assuming too much. I'm sure that it's nothing to worry about. If I know Paul, he'll show up tomorrow with some tall tale to tell. What do you think, Mr. Spade? What does an advertising executive know? Cora, your manners. A sponsor might be listening. Oh. Well, I'm sorry, Sam. I'm upset. Okay, okay. Frankly, I don't know what to think. But if I were a detective, I'd hazard a guess that uh, Paul met with foul play. Oh, nonsense, Spade, nonsense. Come on, everybody, let's have a drink and have some fun. Paul will be back, and even if he isn't, who really cares? Scotch for me. And I guess nobody cared. Rufus was a little more jolly than usual, and the drinks began to dispel the gloom. It was as if Paul Endicott never had existed. It began to get late, and the bizarre wake broke up. Everybody went to bed, including me. I lay there fully dressed, looking up at the beam ceiling for an hour. About then, my doorknob turned, and the door slid open and shut. Someone moved quietly to my bed as I was sliding my thirty-eight out of its holster. Sam, hmm? it's me, Rita. Oh. Are you awake? Yeah, I uh, wasn't even under the covers. Mind if I sit down here? Not a bit. Sam... Hmm? Sam, I'm scared. I wish I could leave here. Oh, what's the matter? Paul's dead. I know he is. He didn't mean anything to me one way or the other, but I know he's dead. Anything to back up your feeling? I guess not. It's, it's just something I'm sure of. Well, why'd you come to me? 
because you're really a detective and I know it. Oh, me? Oh, I... now, you handled a case for my father once. You just don't remember me. All right, I'm a detective. Rufus hired me because he expected trouble. Sam, I'll tell you something about Paul. Yeah? Cora didn't really like him. They were always fighting. She only cares about herself, so she said. Tell me, what kind of a car does Paul drive? Uh, it's a yellow convertible, but mm. it's still in the garage. I checked. Any other cars missing? No, no, they're all there. Oh, and I found out something else. What? Before supper, there was a gun missing from Rufus's gun rack. It's back now. Mm -hmm. Anything else? That's all I know, Sam, except that Paul's dead. I know it. I wish I'd never come up here. <laughs> After she left, I dressed for outdoors and climbed through the bedroom window. It was still and quiet, and it was a quarter moon when I skied away from the chateau. I wanted to look the land over myself before the next day when the clues, if any, were trampled into the snow. When I passed the northern tip of Royal Lake on the trail to the halfway cabin, I saw a new set of ski tracks heading into the woods where I'd found Endicott's body. I followed them, and they went right to the cave where I'd hidden them. And he was gone. I was standing there, pondering this, when I thought I saw something move in the trees to the west of me, I stood stock still. That was a mistake. The bullet splintered a tree next to me, and I shoved off as fast as I could. There was no second shot. I circled around in the trees trying to catch sight of someone. Nothing. I kept in the shadows and made for the halfway cabin. It was dark and quiet, at least until I opened the door. I tried, but he had the advantage of surprise and some kind of a club. I ended up on the floor with someone sitting on my chest. All right, I, I have your gun. You make one wrong move, Spade, and I'll use it's it. It's got bullets in it and a hair trigger, so be careful. We could use a little light. As you see, there's Paul Endicott's body. Yeah. Why did you find him, Tozier? You're only putting a noose around your neck. <laughs> You're a very perceiving man, Mr. Spade. How do you figure I did it? I talk better on my feet. Just remember the gun. If you didn't kill him, how else would you know where the body was? Because I know this country like the back of my hand. He had to be somewhere. You are the killer, Mr. Spade. Me? Why, I do not know. You found the body before anyone else could. Hid it, then clumsily tried to hide your tracks. Don't be silly. Why would I come back? A murderer always worries about his crime. Did he forget something? Was something left undone? It's a natural. It sounds good, except it isn't true. You couldn't pen it on me in a month of Sundays. But somebody might just tie it on to <laughs> you. That's what you think. Do you know what I'm going to do now? I wouldn't want to guess. <laughs> The shots came pouring in through the window, and Tozier Svenborg went down. I saw the flash of a face outside and was gone. I kicked at the lamp, threw the place into darkness, and lay on the floor. Then I crawled over to Svenborg and took my gun back. Uh, well, well, that was a surprise. It hurt quite a bit. Where'd you get it? Oh, somewhere in the back. Let me see. Yeah, it's at the shoulder level. Then he won't die anyway. I'm, I'm afraid. I, I'm afraid I misjudged you, Mr. Spade. Go after him. Go after him and catch whoever it was. I can't leave you here. I'll take care of myself. Just leave me your gun for protection. No, I'll stay. Go, please, while there's time. Or are you afraid? I was, but I gave him my gun and left. Outside, there were many ski tracks, but a fresh set led left from the halfway cabin down. They went right to the edge of Royal Lake and then stopped. There were no marks of ski poles on the ice, so I followed the shoreline, looking for some kind of a clue. It wasn't until I reached the southern tip of Royal Lake that my effort was rewarded. Leading up from the ice were a set of footprints, then a set of ski marks. They led to the boathouse. Inside, I found two interesting items. One, a dismantled ice boat with fresh ice on the runners. Two, a pair of skis with snow in the grooves. I made my way along the beaten path back to the chateau, circled it once, found interesting item number three, and went in. Well, what were you doing up, Spade? Did you hear the shots, too? Yeah. I thought I'd look around. It was cold. It woke me out of a sound sleep, Sam. What was it, you know? Well, I didn't find out about the first shot, Mrs. McLeod. That was fired at me. But the next three were fired at a man named Tozier Svenborg. Oh, no. Tozier? How did it happen, Spade? What's it all about? He found Endicott's body in the woods. Dead? Very. I told you, Sam. I told you. Told him what? What do you know about it? Nothing. I, I just had the feeling, that's all. You know something. Now tell us or I'll slap the rents right out of your head. I don't know anything. Anything at all. I just had a feeling. Who shot Tosha, Spade, and why? I don't know. I was standing with him in the halfway cabin. Somebody shot through the window. Didn't you see them? Don't you know who it was? I was too busy ducking to look. Just answer me one thing. Have any of you been out? Of course not. 
Uh, no. I haven't, and Mr. Allison's in bed. Of course, they all lied. McLeod's shirt was stained with sweat. He'd been moving fast somewhere. The ski pants sticking out from under Cora's robe were wet, and Rita Parker was now dressed when she wasn't before. I was trying to figure out something to say when Charlie Allison came out from his bedroom, rubbing sleep out of his eyes and pulling a robe on. What's going on here? What's all the excitement about? They found Paul, dead. And somebody shot Toja. No. Where is Toja? In the halfway cabin. Well, let's get him to a doctor. I'll call one from town. Uh, why don't you go up and get Toja? I'll have a car ready and we'll take him right into the Lucerne Hospital. Wait a minute. What about the murderer? Who did the shooting? Nobody's getting out of my sight. It had to be one of us. Why, Cora? Well, it wasn't just anybody. We're the only ones left walking. Why don't you ask Sam? He's the detective. Detective? Yes, I hired him because somebody sent me an anonymous letter saying there'd be trouble. You knew there was going to be trouble, Rufus. Somebody else knew. Then why did you let people come up here? Yeah, what's the big no, idea? Sh- do- wait a minute. Spade, what did you find out? Well, if you'll all wait here a minute, I'll tell you. When I circled the chateau before I came in, I'd seen footprints leading to a window, not mine. That meant somebody else used the back way in and out, too. I wanted to find out whose window it was. And, of course, while I was looking, I remember the apparently dismantled ice boat and the fact that a set of skis were in the boathouse. It took me about a minute to find the right room, but somebody knew it. All right, Spade, stand where you are. Allison, you might be a great food technician, but you're a lousy killer. Yeah, well, at least he didn't get her. Neither will you. I've got him, Spade. All right, come on, stand up. Come on. You sap. Cora, huh? You think you could get her by killing somebody? Shut up, leave me alone. I'm sorry for you. Sorry for anyone that ever knew her. I'm sorry for myself. She loves me, you fool. What's the matter? I was sound asleep. We found our killer, Mrs. McLeod. Charlie? Yes, baby, I... Oh, Rufus, it's been a long day. I need a drink. And that goes to show you how cold it can get in the snow country. F, period, end of report. Sam, Mm. why would a man do anything like that? When he he knew he couldn't get away with it? Because he was stupid, Effie. People must have told him a million times if they told him once, crime just doesn't pay. No. Yeah, now go type that up, will you? Go on, scamper, scamper. Oof! Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Here's news of two important musical events. This Saturday, Arturo Toscanini begins a new Saturday series of concerts with the NBC Symphony. And for his premiere, the celebrated maestro Toscanini will present a special hour-and-a-half performance of Verdi's Requiem. And beginning next Monday, you can hear the first in a new series by the Boston Pops Orchestra. up. Mm. All but the P.S. Mm. Page, that is. What P.S. Page? Why should it need a P.S.? Sam, you know that this report, uh, to borrow a phrase from you, is full of holes. My phrase? I wish I'd never said it. Now, for instance, who sent the note to Rufus? Paul Endicott. He expected trouble. That's why he was so belligerent to everybody. All right. Yes. I'm going to come right out and ask you. Good. Why did Allison kill him? Well, I thought it was rather obvious, Effie. Cora was leaving Rufus McLeod for Allison, but because Allison worked for McLeod until Cora's divorce was final, they didn't want Rufus to know about it. So they used Paul Endicott as a decoy love affair. But I'll bet Endicott didn't want to give Cora up. <clears throat> I'll bet that was it, Sam. Effie, I don't know how you ever guessed. Endicott saw in it a chance to pick up a buck with a little blackmail. It was just a wild guess, Sam. Yes. yes. And, of course, Allison did ski, didn't he? What do you think? Well, how else could he get around so fast? <laughs> And he made such a point about those snowshoes. Mm. Sam. Yes? If I'd written the caper, I'd have covered that up a little. Come here. Oh, I'm sorry, Sam. I guess I shouldn't have said that. You certainly should not have. You know there's only one thing around here you're supposed to say. Yes, Sam, I know. I know. What's that? Make it fast. Good night, Sam. (laughs) Good night, sweetheart. The 
The Adventures of Sam Spade are produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade was played by Stephen Dunn. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. Script for tonight's adventure by John Michael Hayes. Musical scoring by Lud Gluskin, conducted by Robert Armbruster. Join us again next week, same time, for another adventure with Sam Spade. Do you keep an appointment book? In 1950, 30,000 people kept an appointment they hadn't bargained for with infantile paralysis. And four out of five of these were helped with March of Dimes money. We must go on helping, yet we also must be prepared for what may come in this year. March of Dimes is your way of fighting infantile paralysis. Give all you can to your local March of Dimes headquarters. Join the 1951 March of Dimes today. The Magnificent Montague next, then it's Duffy's Tavern on NBC. Welcome back. I appreciate Sam's explanation for why the murder did it. Because he was stupid. That explains a lot of criminal activity, and it's also possible to be stupid and also ingenious in some other way, but to act completely unreasonably and illogically. Also, the references to a potential sponsor continue. I don't think I've heard a sustained program make this many references. Uh, Sadly, it's proof that just by asking for a sponsor and hinting at a sponsor doesn't necessarily mean you'll get one. All right, listener comments and feedback now. And feedback now. And we have a YouTube comment on the Red Star Caper via the Prodigal Panda Caper. And we are right, yesterday night, I heard the July 24th, 2023 episode, Adam. I really love listening to your show before going to bed. I was listening on uh, my bedside. The show was Sam Spade and the Red Star Keeper. Your commentary mentioned the guy having a red star in his hand, and also the place was so crowded. And Sam stated he hadn't seen a crowd that large since the... A Margaret Sanger meeting. Why would Sam attend a woman who started the birth control movement uh, that you uh, started talking about Sam being paid with jelly beans? I didn't remember any child on any panda bear, so I replayed to see what you were talking about. I didn't hear anything about jelly beans. I went to the YouTube program, and it was the panda bear jelly bean keeper. <laughs> um, now I get it. You were talking about two different episodes. Okay, well, thank you so much. I apologize for any confusion. After I finish commenting on an episode, I get into listener comments and feedback that often go into previous episodes, and I try to preface those by saying that this was in regards to that previous episode. I'm sorry if that wasn't clear enough, and I hope I don't get an email saying, Margaret Sanger, there was no reference to Margaret Sanger in this episode. What were you talking about? In regards to the Red Star Caper, Sanger was and is a controversial figure. Not going to get into any opinions on that, but I would not read anything into that statement. We don't know why Sam attended. It could have been in some working capacity. He could have been taken along with someone on a date. He could have just been curious because people often... Uh, particularly back in the 20s, will go to an event where someone has been very controversial or there are a lot of people talking about a particular person just to see what they have to say. And Sanger's big uh, events in San Francisco were in the mid-1910s, and then she had a big event at the Oakland Civic Auditorium in 1928. So if you use that later date, which I think makes more sense, then Sam is just saying that he's not attended any public lecture since 1928. As to why he was there, you'd have to ask Sam. Well, now it's time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you to Haskell, Patreon supporter, since August 2015, currently supporting the program at the Shamus level of $4 or more per month. Thank you so much for your support, Haskell. 
And that will do it for today. If you are enjoying this podcast, please follow us with your favorite podcast software. And be sure to rate and review the podcast wherever you download us from. We'll be back next Monday with another adventure of Sam Spade. But join us back here tomorrow for yours truly, Johnny Dollar, where... Oh, why make any bones about it? I'm a sucker for romance. And believe me, it wasn't hard to be serious with money. Johnny. Yeah? This is nice, isn't it? Mm Mm-hmm. I... I I don't believe in love at first sight. Do you? Uh, no. No, I, um... But it is nice, isn't it? Hey, whoa, gal. Mm Mm-hmm? It'd be much too easy to fall in love with you, Vani. And I mean the forever kind. I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.